Majora's Mask. Chapter 20. The Final Night. Small white hands tugged at limp arms and charred fur as if not understanding death. <laughs> what happened? The Deku princess asked. She turned away from the two silent monkeys surrounding the corpse. Uh, that monster, that black thing, is it dead? Um, yes, Link said. The princess remained atop her chunk of stone, eyes still narrowed as she watched the blonde Deku scrub and his fairy. Uh, and you slew it? She asked, clearly doubtful. Who are you? <clears throat> Link, he said, making sure to enunciate to avoid the nickname Mr. Ink again. The princess didn't seem satisfied with that answer. Mm. Well, did that other monkey ask you to come save me? Link nodded. And is he okay? He isn't. Uh... The princess didn't finish, allowing her gaze instead to travel to the only lifeless body in the room. Actually, he kind of needs our help right now, Tattle said. Your father thinks he tricked you into opening the temple and then kidnapped you. He's gonna execute him. The princess's head instantly snapped to the fairy. What? And that was hours ago, Tattle exclaimed. We might be too late. Oh, then we must leave at once. The princess slipped off her perch again, except this time she braced herself for the cold water. She kept her head and snout poking out just as Link had to. Which way to the palace? Uh, yeah, about that, Tattle said, looking around the room. Unless you've got Goron biceps hidden under those robes of yours, no one's lifting that ridiculous door. Link agreed. The door at the other end was absurdly massive, fit only for the giant Odawa. He found himself staring at the mask, which still levitated in place and was surrounded by a pulsing blue light. Am I supposed to do something with that? He wondered. What would happen if I touched it? You okay, Link? Tattle's voice pulled him from his trance. Uh, uh, yeah, he said. I have an idea to get us out of here. You do? Link didn't elaborate further, dropping his sword and removing the mask. His body and items returned to him, though his bag became a nuisance as it floated in the water beside him. After he slid his sword back to its scabbard, he noticed the Deku princess behind him, staring in horror. <laughs> She said, backing away in disbelief until she was up against her boulder. It changed into a human? Link finished for her, smiling as he waded through the water toward the monkeys. I'm not really a Deku scrub. The mask lets me take on that form. The princess uncertainly watched him from afar, clearly still afraid. Eh, she'll get over it, Link decided. Both monkeys shed silent tears over their deceased brother. They hardly noticed when Link stopped beside them. We'll take him with us, Link said. The monkeys didn't react. Blank faces remained staring downward as they stroked burnt, wet fur. Link walked between them, putting his arms underneath the mutilated monkey body. He lifted it from the water, and the surviving monkeys allowed their hands to fall away. Only then did they finally turn to face him, eyes red and swollen. We can bury him in the forest, Link suggested. The monkeys didn't seem to have an opinion on that. We don't have time for this, Link thought, so he continued past them, walking back toward the mask. Where are you going? Tattle asked. To the mask, he said, monkey still in his arms. I think something's going to happen when I touch it. Ah, uh, yeah, but I was thinking we should avoid touching it, seeing how it just tried to kill us. Well, I was thinking we should all make sure to be in contact with each other when I do touch it. Link stopped inches from the mask, turning to face the skeptical monkeys, fairy, and Deku scrub. Wow, that's the best 
best idea you've had yet, Tattle exclaimed. That way, if it's fatal, it'll kill all of us in one blow. Look, I have an inkling this is going to help, Link said. Can't you trust me? Like nothing bad ever happens after I hear that. <laughs> the monkeys ignored the fairy and walked to stand beside Link without saying anything. Oh, you managed to convince the mindless monkeys. Congratulations. The Deku princess gasped, spinning to the fairy beside her. Uh, their brother just died, she exclaimed. Show some respect. Tattle scoffed. I didn't mean it like that. She watched in vain as the princess left her side, too. Link was unable to restrain a smug smile, which made Tattle even more irritated. Uh, I can't stand you sometimes. She sighed, finally flying over herself. All right, fine. I suppose I should be a little less bitter. You did defeat Odawa, so even though every ounce of common sense is telling me to avoid touching the glowing mask that just minutes ago was home to a cloud of darkness that tried to kill and possess all of us. I'll do it. That's the spirit, Link said, still smiling to himself. The entire group stood before the pulsating remains of Odawa. Link secretly felt the smallest hesitation as he considered the fairy's warning. What's the worst that could happen? Instantaneous death, he wagered. And the best possible outcome? Maybe he would transform into Odawa and could make it back to Clock Town in seven massive steps. <clears throat> now that'd be handy. Well, if we're going to do this thing, let's do it, Tattle said, floating down to rest on his shoulder. Okay, everyone else, grab a hold of me too. The monkeys and princess found his legs, and the corpse remained in his arms. He watched the Deku royalty look up eagerly for guidance. Guess the Deku princess got over my transformation pretty quickly, he thought. Though, to be fair, she looked completely dazed and unsure if she was even awake. Link turned to meet Tattle's eyes, and his fairy nodded back. Let's do this. His fingers touched the surprisingly cold, wooden surface of the mask. Instantly, it blinded them all. Link reeled, stumbling backward one step and then another. A piercing, high-pitched ringing flooded his ears as an infinite light drowned his eyes. He tried protecting his face, but the light was everywhere. Slowly, his vision returned, and the ringing faded. But when they did, the chamber in the underwater temple was gone. He found Tattle floating beside him, and she appeared just as confused. Their surroundings seemed to glow. Details came slowly. The monkeys and princess were gone. Only Link and Tattle remained on this new platform. Everything's so fuzzy and dreamlike, he thought. Is the mask playing a trick? The sky was a shimmering green light with water falling from the heavens in columns. They poured into a sea of clouds surrounding the platforms, which stood hundreds of feet tall. Link stepped forward again, reaching out a hand to confirm this was real. It was impossible to break the thin layer of fog veiling everything. <sighs> There's something calm about this place, he thought. Nothing else greeted them, just an empty platform that appeared to float through the clouds. What's that? Tattle asked. Her familiar voice was a knife that cut sharply through the uncertainty. It was grounding. Link followed her gaze to something in the distance. It was hardly perceptible amidst the glowing light, clouds, and water. A dark brown spot. <clears throat> a creature? Is it flying? How is it up here with us? The ball, which maybe was its face, rested on two long, slender legs that traveled down to rest atop the clouds, as if they were solid. The being appeared to be a round head resting on legs. It did, however, wield elongated, lanky arms. All of this he couldn't be sure of. It was barely a silhouette standing so far away. Is that a spirit? Link asked. He squinted to try making out more. Was it sealed inside the mask? 
Before Tattle could respond, another sound presented itself. Alongside the peaceful scenery, a powerful, deep voice echoed across the landscape. It seductively drew Link further away from himself, back out of the certainty Tattle's voice had created. The melody came from the distant spot with arms and legs. <sighs> this place is dangerous, Link thought as the haziness took hold again. It's trying to take me away from my body, to keep me in the clouds. Listen... Tattle said. I think it's saying something. It sounds more like singing, Link replied. He took a step closer to the edge, still soaking wet from temple water. His boots squished against the solid platform. Link looked back up to Tattle, drenched hair still damp against his forehead. His hat remained a ball scrunched in his bag. The fairy never looked away from the distant creature. Could that crying... Be its way of teaching us a melody? Uh, maybe, Link wondered. The notes threatened to lull him again. Regardless of anything else, he was in awe at the song's gracefulness. Don't just stand there, Tattle snapped. Get your instrument! Link didn't bother protesting and slid the clay ocarina from his belt. Bringing it up to his mouth, he quickly found the right pitches. In only a short minute... Link was playing along with the creature, and his melody was just as beautiful as the beings. Their songs became one. When the spirit stopped, Link did as well, bringing his arms down and clutching the blue instrument tightly. Then the creature transitioned to speaking. Its voice was as mighty and awesome as its song. Call us. Call us. Link and Tattle, standing side by side, stared in collective awe at the majestic beings surrounded by bliss. They noticed too late that the bright light was enveloping them again. Soon, the creature and its dream world were gone. Link's senses returned with surprising clarity. Even though it was the dead of night, the stars illuminated woodfall enough to clash with the distant dream. He could smell the swampy air and feel the gentle breeze. He was no longer deep underground in an ancient temple or trapped in a hazy world. <sighs> I'm back! He smiled, now standing on the wooden platform where he'd played the Sonata of Awakening. The weight of the corpse returned to his arms, and he heard a shrill scream as the Deku Princess materialized, too. <laughs> She stumbled over the platform's pedestal, barely scrambling back to her feet. We're in the swamp! Uh, the Deku princess exclaimed. Uh, the mask sent us here? The monkey stirred beside her as well, looking around with just as much confusion. When something small and wooden clattered onto the platform beside him, Link looked down to find Odawa's mask. It lay still and empty void of its magical qualities. Beyond the platform, Woodfall Temple sat in the late night. The water surrounding it, and presumably the whole swamp, had returned to normal. No more purple, Link realized. Tattle remained speechless, staring off as if they'd never left that strange in-between world. Are you okay? Link asked. Yeah, Tattle said. I was just remembering what Tail said, about the four people we're supposed to find? Do you think he was talking about that singing creature? You think it might have been a spirit sealed inside that mask? Link didn't answer. He hadn't connected those dots himself. Maybe? He thought. I think we did it, Link. I think we found one of the four. He recalled Tail's cry. Swamp! Mountain! Ocean, canyon, the four who are there, bring them here. Oh, Nehru, Link realized. Tattle, I think you're right. That means everything we did, it was all worth it. <laughs> yeah, Tattle said, finally smiling. But don't think that means I'm going to apologize. You're still an idiot for diving into that temple and expecting to come back out alive. Link laughed. 
What do you think this means for the other ones? Mountain, ocean, and canyon? I guess they're all spirits. Do you think they're trapped inside of masks like that one, waiting to be saved? That would make sense, the fairy reasoned. It would explain why they can't help us right now. Maybe they've all been sealed away by the Skull Kid, like Odalwa. Maybe all of the other lands will be cursed like this one. Tattle didn't respond immediately. Hmm. Then we'll have to be extra careful. All of the other ones are probably just as dangerous. At least we kind of know what we're doing now, Link said. Save the four spirits and call them with that song on top of the clock tower. An oath to order, huh? Tattle said, looking away thoughtfully. I suppose it would explain everything Tail said. Ah, the moon! Tattle was cut short by the Deku Princess's shriek. Link and Tattle turned to see her arm raised, pointed at the sky. The blonde-haired boy and fairy both looked up. Odin, Tattle said. Odin, that's not good. The moon appeared to be resting on top of the clock tower. Its large eyes beamed down at the kingdom beneath it, only hours away from crushing everything. We have to take the princess back to the palace, Link said urgently. Now... All traces of celebration and excitement vanished. There's never a moment to rest, is there? He thought. Tattle opened her mouth to protest. But... Tattle! Link interrupted. He knew exactly what she was going to say. Please, as soon as the clock tower falls, I'll play the song of time, no matter where we are or what we're doing. We promise to get the princess back and... All right, fine, Tattle said. But don't... We still have to find the witches. We will, he said, turning to the network of bridges leading back to the palace. (laughs) Wait, a monkey shouted. Link stopped, still carrying their brother's corpse. (laughs) Give us brother. (laughs) The creature tried being assertive, but its sadness shone through. Its eyes were red, and its voice was choked with tears. I said I would... Bury him for you, Link said. (laughs) But we must, the monkey said. We, we bury him. You save other brother. No time. Link opened his mouth to argue further, but Tattle shot him a glance that told him that wasn't a good idea. (sighs) Okay, he sighed, bending down to release the small limp body. Both monkeys removed him from Link's arms, one shuddering as if just now understanding what had happened. The other monkey looked up to calm them and then turned back to Link. (laughs) Thank you. For everything. (laughs) And then the monkeys walked along the wooden bridges ahead of them, leaving Link, Tattle, and the princess behind. How awful! The princess said, her face torn somewhere between pity, terror, and disbelief. We'll make sure no other monkeys die by getting to your father in time, Link said. The princess emphatically agreed. Before they set off, Link retrieved the mask once known as Odawa. He placed it alongside his other belongings, his bag's wet flap flapping heavily over the opening. Ugh! It's going to take forever to dry all the way off. He hoped their run would help. The nighttime wind was cool on his face as he sprinted alongside Tattle and the princess. The king sat darkly in his chair, orange eyes glaring at the monkey's cage. The small white creature, all hope, drained from his eyes, hung limply from the pole he was tied securely to. The Deku king, bulbous flower atop his head, toyed with the staff leaning against his chair. Anger seemed to cloud every thought in his head. Please, sir. Silence! The monarch exclaimed, turning toward his other prisoner. The thin Deku scrub with the green handlebar mustache was on his knees, chains wrapped around his wrists. They were padlocked to the floor and forced him to kneel. He looked just as dejected as the monkey, turning from his master's glare to the roaring fire in the center of the room. (sighs) 
You're lucky I don't toss you in there with that monkey. Your act of treason makes you just as guilty. The butler didn't respond. Chains rattled as he tried to make himself more comfortable on the floor. After a lifetime of service, the butler thought, this is my reward. The entire room shook violently. The butler, king, guards, and monkey all were powerless before the vibrating ground, clinging to staffs, chains, ropes, and spears to quell their fear. The earthquake didn't last very long, but they all knew it wasn't the last one. The moon might soon make all executions irrelevant, the butler thought. It left them in silence once again. Only the orange flames broke it with the sound of crackling heat. <laughs> my king! My king! The Diku king rose his head to the entrance of the chambers, as did the butler beside him. A guard ran in, clearly out of breath. <laughs> Your princess, she has returned! The monarch's eyes instantly widened, jumping from his chair, staff in hand. What? Seconds later, a blonde headed human, appearing just shy of adulthood, ran in with the Diku princess at his side. A familiar fairy accompanied him. The boy stopped as soon as he entered the room, but the princess didn't. She ran as fast as she could to her father, who stood in disbelief. The monkey smiled broadly from his cage at the drenched hatless boy, but the butler was just as confused as his master. My god, is that the fairy from earlier? Who is this boy? Oh, my princess! The Diku king exclaimed, smiling broadly. My darling princess, you are all right. I was so worried. His smile, however, did not last long. His daughter's face was contorted in anger, shaking as she stopped in front of his chair. She noted the butler chained beside him. Uh, foolish father! She screamed. She continued trembling, unable to contain her boiling fury. Before the monarch could even consider a response, his daughter tackled him and proceeded to stomp on his chest in a blind rage. The Diku king, in all his power, cowered feebly underneath the might of his young daughter. The guards in the room tentatively approached the scuffle, but the Diku princess shot them one glare before they thought better of intervening. <laughs> what are you doing? She said. Let that monkey go this instant! <laughs> the guards obeyed. They scrambled for the cage, opening the wooden gate to the still-smiling monkey. The boy and fairy, who'd been standing out of place by the door, slowly approached the throne. The Diku princess stopped attacking her father and hopped down to release the butler from his chains. The Diku king watched the approaching human and fairy as he struggled to stand. He tried to hide his exposed weakness, planting his staff firmly on the floor as he straightened his back. <coughs> Who uh, are you? <coughs> he bellowed unconvincingly. <coughs> The princess screamed, clicking the handcuffs open. The butler's wrists came free, and it was the sweetest sound he'd ever heard. Oh, finally, he thought. <laughs> He's the one who saved me! The butler thanked the princess and rose to his feet, rubbing his sore hands as he watched the ensuing conversation. <sighs> Is this true? The Diku king asked the boy. Did you save my daughter? The boy didn't respond immediately. He took another step forward, stopping right beneath the dais. Yes. He paused, reaching into his bag to retrieve an item. He slipped a mask, perhaps, over his face. It bore the resemblance of a Diku scrub, and suddenly the boy became someone else. The monarch's eyes widened, as did the butler's, whose happy face soon turned much grimmer. But I'm also the Diku scrub from earlier. The butler's mind went numb. Impossible, he thought. Oh, you, you're the one I almost killed? The king asked as the newly turned scrub nodded. 
my humblest apologies. Hasty decision-making is my weakness. This time, more than ever, it has become clear to me. I forgive you. When the young scrub's eyes flashed to the butler, he noticed too late. The older scrub couldn't hide his sad, transfixed stare in time. The butler opened his mouth to explain, but the young scrub turned away back to the monarch. Oh, he must think me a fool, the butler thought. A sad, pathetic old fool. Um, your daughter was missing, the blonde scrub continued. And you were willing to do whatever it took to get her back. I understand. I wish there was some way for me to express my gratitude, the king said. Oh, strange traveler, there is little I can do. Please feel welcome to take shelter here from the moon. Uh, we would, <laughs> the fairy said, interrupting the boy scrub. But we have somewhere else we need to be. Very well, the Deku king said. Just remember, we have more than enough provisions for you, should you choose to stay. His face. The butler thought, hardly aware of the conversation and still staring. It's him. It's really him. Thank you, <laughs> the fairy said, turning to leave. Before they could, the monkey ran forward gleefully to intercept them. Oh, oh, Mr. Link! The creature happily exclaimed. The fairy sighed, but the hero, Link, beamed happily back at the monkey. The Deku princess leapt down from the platform to join them as well, putting her arm around the monkey. Oh, Mr. Monkey, I, I am truly sorry, she said. Father does such rash things when he worries about me. Okay, okay, forget about that, the monkey reassured her. We're both safe now. Has the temple been returned to normal? Yes, thanks to Mr. Link here, the Deku princess said. I am very truly grateful. <laughs> Link nodded, though some grim news appeared hidden behind this gesture. When his eyes met the princesses, the butler knew they were both keeping something from the monkey, but neither wanted to be the one to tell him. I'm glad I could help, Link reassured them. Are you sure you don't want to stay, at least for the rest of the night? The princess asked. You're soaked, and I'm sure you're hungry, too. I'll be fine, Link said, trying to hide the hand clutching his stomach. I have a, a lot to do before the night's over. The fairy whispered sharply at his side. Come on, Link, we have to go. Okay, okay, just one more thing. Link brushed the fairy away, turning to face someone else again. Me. Until then, the butler had remained a bystander, hands absently holding his sore wrists as everyone congratulated the hero. The hero who has stolen my son's face. The tall Deku scrub remained atop the platform near his monarch. He tried looking away from the young scrub, but Link ignored that and approached him nonetheless. You have to look at him, the butler thought. You have to talk to him. So he summoned the courage. His son's eyes shone back at him. <clears throat> There's something I want you to have, Link said, bringing his hands to his face. The mask pulled free, and he was a human again. The butler only jumped slightly at the transformation, he lifted his head to meet Link's dark blue eyes, unable to look at the object in his hands. The mask lay there, face up. Frozen, orange eyes beheld their father in terror. When I first came to Glocktown, I was cursed, Link explained. And I thought it was just my own personal Deku scrub form the Skull Kid forced upon me. But I think it was more than just that. I think... Somehow, the Skull Kid turned me into your son. The Deku butler continued to listen, refusing to look down at the mask or anyone else in the room. But I think it goes even further than that. 
I think somehow the Skull Kid bound me to your son's actual spirit, and that when I played my ocarina to free myself from it, your son's spirit, it sealed itself in into this mask. When I returned to my human form for the first time, I spoke to a Deku scrub, one who looks exactly like me when I wear the mask. I thought it was a weird dream, but I'm not sure now. The Deku scrub told me I would find his father, and that when I did, he wanted me to tell him, uh, to tell you, that he didn't run away. He didn't run away, the butler thought. His mouth hung open in shock. He never meant to leave me. How is this possible? How is my son reaching out to me after all this time? He hardly felt the tears that welled up. Uh, he just wanted to see the world. And he never meant to leave forever. And he loves you. He wanted me to make sure I told you that, too. Link stopped, the mask still in his hands. The human waited as if for some comment or reply, but the old Deku scrub merely remained staring. Um, that's why I want you to have my, er, your mask, Link said. Whether or not there's actually a part of your son in this, it definitely was touched by him, and maybe the last Link to him. His blue eyes didn't waver, and for the first time since he'd been freed, the butler spoke. Thank you. He smiled, and he cried. My son. <laughs> the butler thought, though his mind stopped there, he realized that the tears falling were happy. Please don't let this be a dream. Let this be real. Link returned the smile as he offered him the mask, but the butler grabbed his warm hand with his cold wooden one and pushed it gently away. <laughs> but I cannot have that. Link seemed confused as he brought the mask back to his side. I need to learn how to let go of my son. He's gone. And if I kept his mask, I don't think I'd ever come to terms with that. The Deku butler brought up a hand to wipe away his tears. <sighs> and now that you've told me what you have, I think I finally can. Thank you, but please, use his mask on your adventures. Let him continue helping the world as he always wanted. I'm sorry if I caused you any discomfort. Please forgive my rudeness. Uh, don't apologize, Link said, clutching the Deku scrub mask and examining its features closely. I'm happy I could help you. Instead of standing in the awkward discomfort, the human boy walked out, returning the mask to his bag as all eyes turned to him. The butler watched as he left, restraining himself from screaming for his son's face. Don't, the butler reminded himself. Don't do that. Don't taint this happiness. Let him go. Link did stop, however. One step off the dais, the butler wondered if the boy had read his mind. Is he going to offer me the mask again? The butler wondered. He didn't know if he could say no a third time. The hero turned back. I wasn't sure if I should tell you, Link said, but... Your son. I think I know where he is. Where his body is. The butler's smile left immediately. <sighs> Inside of Clocktown's tower, at its base, there's a doorway leading to an underground passage. I saw a Deku scrub there that looked a lot like your son. I didn't think about it until now, but I'm certain it's him. I... I just... I just thought you should know. He paused as if expecting a response. When the butler didn't give one, Link turned away and stepped down from the platform. The Deku King, Princess, Guards, and Monkey 
all watched as Link and the fairy rounded the fire pit and left. The butler could only stare after the empty doorway. Link and Tattle left the Grand Deku Palace doorway. The wooden bridge was once again under Link's boots, except this time it crossed over regular water. Well, the poison really did vanish everywhere, Link thought, because we defeated Odawa and freed that spirit. The blonde-headed boy and his fairy stopped for a moment to think. I'm glad we went back to the palace, Tattle said. The butler really needed that. I'm glad I connected all the dots when we left the temple. He needed closure with his son. I hope I gave him that. Me too, Tattle said. And we've thoroughly cleaned that disgusting swamp and saved some others along the way. <laughs> we've been quite the good little adventurers, haven't we? Got to live up to my name, don't I? Right, the hero of time. Bleh, barf. Now, Mr. Hero, I believe we have one last piece of business to take care of before we finally leave this boggy swamp of despair. I presume you remember the way back to the witch's hut? Of course, Link said, looking up at the nighttime sky. The stars were no longer visible. The world had darkened tremendously since leaving the temple. Why did it suddenly get so cloudy? His attention turned to the moon. Their time was almost up. Wait a minute, Link thought. He squinted, suddenly suspicious of the newly formed clouds. Was it cloudy on the final night last time? He realized only part of the sky had grown pitch black near the rock wall separating the palace from the swamp. <laughs> Do you smell burning? Tattle asked. They both suddenly realized those weren't clouds. It was a plume of smoke. A horrible queasiness caused Link's empty stomach to sink further. Something's wrong. Come on, the fairy said. Let's take the Deku flower up to the ledge. We'll have a better view. Link nodded, slipping the Deku mask over his face and running across the bridge. He hopped over the water and dove into the flower, popping up onto the higher cliff. Tattle remained by his side the entire time. Link removed his mask and returned it to his bag as they passed through the cave. He exited at the beginning of the mushroom-topped trees, acting as stepping stones. They stopped, mouths agape. One reality consumed the swamp across the river. Fire. The forestry on the other side was ablaze. Purple flames destroyed the wood and bellowed out huge waves of smoke. The flames suffocated the sky, reaching as high as the one Link caused yesterday. It stretched into the horizon, not sparing a single tree on the line bordering the swamp. Before either Link or Tattle could react, a small figure flew over a rock wall. The Skull Kid stopped abruptly when he saw the boy and his fairy. Oh... <laughs> <laughs> no one moved. Link's mind went blank with pure terror, mere prey beholding a predator. Disbelief and shock rendered him motionless. The Skull Kid remained just as still above them, his masked face bearing down on them. Majora's dark stare never wavered. The Skull Kid moved first, drawing an arm back and bringing his fingers together. Tattle screamed. <laughs> The imp thrust his arm forward. Violet fire poured from his palm already halfway toward the boy when he regained control of his body. Link hurled himself to the side. Tattle flew up and out of its path. The boy barrel rolled forward as the purple fire struck the ledge. The dark flames continued in a constant stream from the masked imp's hand. The Skull Kid moved his arm, directing the fire to pursue Link. The boy felt it nearly on his back as he returned to his feet, red mushrooms squishing beneath his boots. Before he could catch his breath, Link leapt again, this time off the plant. <sighs> the fire spewed behind him, barely missing his blonde head. He fell several feet onto the swamp's grassy ledge. His knees screamed in protest, but Link couldn't stop. He pressed onward, sprinting along the shore away from the imp, the dock, and the palace entrance. When the fire didn't pursue him, Link looked over his shoulder. The imp appeared over the mushroom tree, already preparing another spell. 
Link ran faster, panting as his legs still ached from falling and Odawa. He felt the deadly, violet heat coming down like a hammer on his head. The next step forward would bring death. Link tossed himself over the grassy ledge instead, into the swamp water. He kicked himself downward to sink further. Brilliant purple light exploded above him, missing its target and now a firework upon the shoreline. Link swam as fast as he could, but running and jumping without stopping left him short of breath. Already he struggled for air. His hands and arms felt weak as he pulled himself forward. He didn't get far. The water around him moved against the stream, suddenly clinging to his body as a fist would. No. Somehow he was being lifted into the air. The Skull Kid, with his hands outstretched and his fingers manipulating the water, plucked Link from the rest of the swamp. He was trapped in a thin, human-shaped water bubble. The imp flung his arms violently to the left and the water restraining Link obeyed. He slammed into the rock wall. The bubble immediately came apart and Link plummeted back to the ground. The painfully jagged wall left him dazed and the solid ground knocked away all remaining breath. Every bone shrieked in agony. He remained gaping on the scorched, drenched grass like a dying fish. He saw the Skull Kid approach from afar to finish him off. Link struggled to move but could do no more than gasp for air. The imp already drew his arm back for a final blow, and his dark blue eyes shone fearfully at his killer. However, something caught the imp's attention. He noticed a ball of bright, orange fire hurtling toward his turned back. The Skull Kid spun around just in time, releasing the purple fire intended for Link. Orange and violet collided, dissipating to leave only a red night illuminated by the raging forest fire. The imp searched for its source, sweeping the flaming tree line. He heard something else whistling in his direction, this time from the swamp water. He spotted the projectiles beneath him and narrowly dodged thick, sharp icicles that leapt up from the water's surface. The Skull Kid found Kotake floating above the water. The old woman rode her broomstick, one arm gripping its handle as the other finished freezing the watery missiles. The blue gem on her forehead went dark as she completed her spell. Her white hair stood tall above contorted rage. The imp opened his mouth to speak, but he stopped when he noted an identical twin on a similar broomstick flanking him. Her gem was orange, and Koma's expression matched her sister's. The imp narrowed his eyes, though Majora's mask hid them. He backed up to keep both witches in his line of sight, readying his hands for more magic. You! You burned our forest! The ice witch named Kotaka shrieked. Again! You almost killed us! <laughs> we command you to stop! Koma said. The Skull Kid simply floated in place, looking back and forth between them. We won't allow you to abuse whatever power you found. You toy with things you do not understand. Like an immature child. <sighs> I'm not a child, he exclaimed. He watched Kome flinch at his darkened voice, though she quickly hid it. <laughs> but I saw, the Skull Kid thought. You're afraid. You know this mask means trouble. like one, Koma said, forcing her to return his glare. If you are not a child, then throw it, Kotaka said. Remove that mask and surrender it. Its abilities are obviously too much for you to handle. The Skull Kid said nothing, though the forest fire was all the noise necessary to break the silence. His eyes darted to the boy and saw that he'd gotten to his feet, one hand against the rock wall as he leaned over in exhaustion. The boy watched the events taking place with concern, and the fairy was by his side. The ground shook again. He watched the boy stumble off the wall and almost fall into the water. I'll kill them last, the imp decided. When Koman Kotake looked up to the moon fearfully, the Skull Kid took his chance. He released a large bout of fire in Kotake's direction. The witch's face, darkly beholding the source of the earthquake, turned instead to the purple death hurtling toward her. 
Let the battle begin, the Skull Kid thought. Kotake flung both of her arms upward. A thick shield of ice stretched upward from the water and absorbed the flames. The imp had already prepared for Koma's retaliation and flew from the path of the orange fireball meant for him. Link's eyes watched in amazement. The wayward orange flames slammed into the swamp water and barely missed them. Their brief, brilliant light turned to smoke, curling upward into the red night. What do we do? Tattle asked. She didn't dare turn away from the battle between the three magicians. A spare lightning bolt or ice shard could hurtle their way any moment. Uh, we should wait, Link said, for Koma and Kotake to win. But what if they don't? Tattle asked. They remained staring above grimly as the fate of Terminal was decided. The Skull Kid conjured another wave of dark fire and aimed it at Kome. The Orange Witch countered this with another burst of her own, making it powerful enough to dispel the dark magic and reach the Imp. The Skull Kid pulled upward a wave of swamp water, channeling it to swirl around him like a great ball. The newly formed sphere absorbed the fire, foaming gracefully around him. He then commanded the water shield to form a tentacle which whipped itself at Kome. The witch's orange gem glowed brightly as she created a tentacle of her own, made of fire. The two clashed midair, sizzling, burning, and cooling in a brilliant splash. The imp shivered when the air within his water sphere grew cold. He heard crackling as the water hardened, expanding and freezing around him. <sighs> Kotake! He thrust his arms outward to release fire, which destroyed the lethal ice and protective water alike. Immediately following his newfound freedom, the fire tentacle, no longer obstructed by his own, lashed out. The Skull Kid brought up his hands to defend himself, battling fire with fire to extinguish the orange flames. He turned to see Kotake's next spell, already hurtling toward him, sharp, thick ice arrows. The Skull Kid conjured enough fire to disintegrate some of them. One still cut through his arm and another stuck through his shoulder. The imp bared his teeth in pain. It worsened when Kotake caused the ice lodged in his shoulder to expand. The imp screamed, gripping the end of the growing ice arrow. <laughs> his fingers retracted when they met icy barbs. Orange fire was once again hurtling toward him. He felt its heat as his shoulder seared with agony. The imp held up his arms, causing his entire body to glow with purple flames. The ice arrow melted and then he flung the spell at Koma's attack. The fire still made its way through, sending the masked imp spiraling into the swamp water. The river immediately hardened and cooled around him, but he wouldn't let Kotake hurt him again. The Skull Kid screamed, letting loose another explosion of fire to destroy the ice as he rose from the swamp in a rage. The witches gave him no rest. Long ice spikes rose from the river's surface to stab him. The Skull Kid barely avoided them, dodging one after the next until his back was against the rock wall. He caught the boy and tattled in his peripheral, just below him on the grassy ledge. The boy and his ocarina in hand ready to escape with his magical song. No! The Skull Kid changed targets, sending dark fire at his fleeing adversaries. Kotake easily conjured a shield of ice to save them. The flames were no match for its cool surface, and then her shield became a weapon. It formed pointed tips and hurtled toward the Skull Kid. The imp flung his arm against the rock wall, commanding a chunk of earth to shatter the icy weapon. With the same stroke of his arm, he took more chunks of the wall with him. Kome herded him away from the boy and the fairy with more fire, but the Skull Kid no longer cared. Massive chunks of rock now surrounded him in a circular orbit. He watched the witch's worried faces as the rocks joined together to form larger ones. The fire and ice sorcerers never stopped bombarding him as the rocks compacted together. The boulders acted as his shield, stopping the ice rising from beneath him and the fire coming from afar. The imp smiled as he mapped out his next several moves. The earth gave him a chance to think. Koma and Kotake desperately attempted to deprive him of this luxury with spell after spell. Koma sent a continuous thick stream of fire into the rock shielding the imp, applying as much pressure as she could. The Skull Kid held it steady, and he noticed the water below him hardening into a massive, spiked platform. 
Moving to avoid the ice would dislodge his earth shield, so the witches had effectively cornered him. But the imp was ready. As the platform of ice flew up to kill him, the Skull Kid shattered it with a burst of dark fire. He allowed the same explosion to turn his rock shields into projectiles. One went directly through the flames pouring from Kome's hand. The witch gasped, but had no time to move. The boulder slammed into her, causing a sickening crunch as she fell from her broom into the water. Kotake managed to avoid the boulder meant for her, but safety did not await her on the other side. The Skull Kid had brought his fingers together to generate his next attack. The purple lightning left his fingertips in precision, deadly, and instantaneous. It struck Kotake directly in the chest. She fell limply to the swamp seconds after her sister. The Skull Kid laughed, floating undefeated as he watched his victim's watery graves. <laughs> I need to make sure they're dead, he thought. He floated closer to the river to do just that, but then he remembered the others. The Skull Kid snapped around to face the boy in tattle. The fairy rested on her companion's shoulder, who had his ocarina in mouth. The boy's fingers melodically plugged the holes as he exhaled into the instrument. <sighs> no! The masked imp conjured as much fire as he could. The boy and Tattle vanished seconds before it reached them. The purple fire passed over empty, scorched grass to crash into a blank rock wall. They were gone. The Skull Kid flew quickly to their ledge as the fire cleared, but his eyes filled with horror when he realized there was nothing there. <sighs> no, he stammered. No, no. He grabbed his head and trembled, transfixed by the dark water reflecting the raging forest fire's glow. The voice of Majora powered his vocal cords as he screamed. They're gone! They got away! The fury caused every muscle to twitch, every vein to bulge. And then he saw one of the witches climbing out of the water. Her long, white hair was damp and hanging over her shoulders. Her arms shook. She coughed up huge mouthfuls of water. <coughs> Koma's whole body lurched. She collapsed in exhaustion on the grass. I can't move. I can't think. The imp's shadow soon fell over her. Kome looked up, meeting the mask in its rage. She beheld its dark gaze and was powerless before it. Just as the Skull Kid raised his arms to kill her, however, he vanished. <coughs> what? The witch stared in confusion, but he left no trace. God, she thought. To sit there. She half expected him to return, but he never did. Kome looked around to see only herself as she lay down panting. The orange gem on her head was dull in the swamp's reflection. The purple forest fire's halo continued pulsing above her. Kome buried her face into the grass, shaking as her body throbbed in agony. <sighs> oh, my bones, my legs, my arms, broken. I'm going to die tonight. A splash of cold water broke her misery. She saw that a dark mass had drifted its way over to her ledge, rocking against the shore. She scooted herself closer and peered into the water to recognize the shape as her sister. Kotake! The witch grabbed her sibling's shoulders and lifted her from the water. Kome struggled with Kotake's weight, but she managed to roll her sister's back onto the grass. <laughs> Komet tried shaking her awake, but her pale, still expression shone in the violet red night. Kotake's eyes were half open, and the water dripped from them. She looks like she's crying. Water also shone back from deep within the ice witch's throat. Kotake. Come on, she whispered. Her voice was only a ghost, 
a whisper that died on her lips. There was no response. Koma shook her head. Her long, crooked nose was soon lined with tears of her own. She removed her hands from her sister's chest to find a deep scorch mark. She stared at the injury in disbelief. Koma flung herself on top of her sister's corpse, shaking now as she sobbed. Kotake was unresponsive and motionless beneath her, head lolled to the side as she stared at nothing. <laughs> Kotake! Come back! The witch looked up to the sky, directly at the moon hovering over Clock Town. The forest fire burned the land beneath it. No, she said, trembling. They, they were right. Fedora is back. The gods can't help us anymore. Fedora is back. Her cries went unheard as the dark walls and still swamp water drank them. Koma rested her head on her sister's chest and curled up to lay beside her. The clock tower's bells echoed across the doomed land.